Have you ever sometimes, and many of you probably have little ones, you, could, you ever sometimes can tell when your little one lies? I mean, are you good at that, detecting that? Can you see when they, you know they're lying? Oh, you're lying. <laughs> and they're like, no, I'm not. And their eyeballs are floating around on you. you. I could always catch my kids on that. And then there are some that are really good. And you're kind of like, oh, maybe you're kind of telling the truth. I don't know. You know, there are certain people that are pretty good at that gift. Um, and then, you know, there are people that, you know, we know can struggle with mental illness and um, uh, believe that there's somebody they're not. And I can remember when I was a young man, there was this guy that um, I would visit and he was really convinced. I was young, I didn't know anything, and he was convinced he was Moses. And I was like, you're not Moses. I didn't know the Bible, but I knew he wasn't Moses. And uh, he was pretty convinced of that idea. Well, what I want to do this morning is help us understand something is the big idea. And this is where we're going to be looking at in this section that we'll be opening up this morning, and that is we all need to decide whether Jesus is Lord, you've heard this before, uh, a lunatic or a liar, and uh, we're going to wrestle with that this morning, and so the three things that we're going to be looking at as we've been talking about the Gospel of Mark is we're going to be looking at a kingdom's belief, and you see it in your outlines and your you versions and a kingdom belief in terms of the son of God. And then we're going to look at a kingdom doubter and relating to the son of God and the kingdom haters and how kingdom haters can actually hate the son of God. Uh, but before we do that, and we hit in this text, it looks pretty big, right? I'm sure of it. Just hold on. Here we go. Right? You ready? You ready to be with me this morning? Oh, wow. This is going to be fun. Go. Thanks, Josh. I like you. One fan. Okay, Mark 1. Here's one of the things that this gospel helps us with. Is it helps us understand something as it relates to this book that is written to Roman citizens, right? Gospel it gets right after it. No wasting any time. But we understand that Jesus' baptism, he says this, something very important because it's the theme throughout this book. And it is the word from the Father. Jesus is baptized and the Father says, you are my son and whom I love with whom I am well pleased. What is he saying? The father is saying, you are my son. You've been son for all of eternity. Now I'm introducing you to all of humanity. Powerful book. And so we're going to get right into it because the thing I want you to notice, first of all, is the kingdom belief. Everybody has a belief, but I want us to look at a crowd belief, and then I want to look at demons and how they believe, and then I want to let's look at the apostles' belief, all right? And we're going to their belief in what? The Son of God. We're going to let the Bible teach us this morning. And so have your Bibles, look at your phone if you have it, and don't be looking at anything else but the passage itself. Promise? Good. That's good. Because I can always tell when you're not paying attention. Okay, look at this. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. And when they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, and Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to do what? They were pushing to touch him. Notice in verse seven, we're looking at large crowds, tens of thousands of people. You might say, whoa, this is our Jesus. He's so popular. Isn't this wonderful? And these people, I bet they're so thrilled they get to be around this Jesus because it says in verse seven that there was a large crowd, tens of thousands. But this large crowd comes because why? They heard about him and they heard about what? They're fascinated. You know how quickly the word of mouth can travel? You don't need Facebook to make things move real quickly among people. And it did. It moved fast and it moved strong. And people became fascinated with what they were hearing. And the people that were coming were extremely diverse, weren't they? Look at that. From Judea, from Galilee, all of Israel showed up. They're saying all of Israel came. But it didn't end there. You would think, okay, that's good. He's Jew. He's a rabbi. I get all that. But it moves out to Tyre and Sidon. In other words, Gentiles are showing up and they're coming and they're traveling on foot or by a camel. They didn't have cars. They didn't have any other way to get there. No planes. They had to walk by foot and they would travel up to 120 miles. Why? Because they're fascinated. 
Look what the crowd is doing. Now you might think, this is wonderful. Jesus is so popular. I am so glad that I identify myself with a very popular man. Well, I want you to read the rest of the story. Notice that the text tells us in verse 9, to keep the people from crowding, what did he do? He jumped on a boat. The word for crowding is a word for crushing. In other words, it became a very dangerous situation. The crowd got out of control. The crowd started pushing in on him. And why were they pushing in on him? Because they wanted to touch him. They wanted to touch his power. And so they became a mob. And Jesus becomes desperate. And in verse 10, it says they were pushing to do what? To touch him. If I just touch you, I will be healed. Now, what does this touching mean as this mob gets out of control? And if I happen to have a son or a daughter that had a disease or demon possessed, I would want to touch them too so that there could be instant healing. And this was a different kind of healing than some of us would imagine. There's no human that could heal like this because this was a partial healings. This wasn't sort of a healing. I feel a little bit better. Thank you for healing me. This is not what that is. This is the son of God, the creator healer. This is the one who created you, who made you in his image. He is the great physician. When he restored a hand, he knew what he was doing when he was restoring a hand. And there's a text to that. John 1, 3 says this about our Jesus. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In other words, all of us have been created by the second person of the Trinity, and so he knew how to restore you fully from the inside out. If he was to restore a blind man, he knew because he created the retina. <laughs> Is that cool? So when he does it, he does it fully, never partially. And you can imagine why there's desperation to want to get next to him, to get some healing, because in those days, medicine was primitive. So what was the problem with the crowd? I'll tell you what the problem of the crowd is with their belief, is none of them are calling him a liar, none of them are calling him a lunatic, and not one of them is calling him Lord. The crowd assembled for the right one, that is true, but the crowd came for the wrong reason. You see, they didn't come, and they could care less what Jesus was preaching and saying. They could care less if he was a lunatic or a liar or a lord. They could care less. The only thing they cared about as a crowd was, can you heal me? Can you take care of my son and my daughter or my husband so we can feed our family and get back to normal? Could you do that for us? And many times today, we have people that come to the church for the crowd, and they could care less what Jesus says, they could care less what he preaches, and they could care less about him proclaiming to be the son of God. That is true today. So there's a crowd belief, but there's also a demon belief that I want us to look at. Look at this in the text, verse 11. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you're the son of God, but he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. I remember when I was a young man in junior high. How many of you know what a Ouija board is? Raise your hand. Okay, well, Ouija board is really where you're kind of calling on certain spirits and you believe that you can have those spirits who have a better insight in terms of the future and you think they're not limited. You think that they actually could see down the road and in the future and some of that kind of stuff. And we were young people and we were looking at it. You had your girls here, you like it, you know, and, and you we're moving them around. You're asking questions. Well, does she like me in, in the future? And I mean, it was one of those things. You actually believed it. But I remember one time I asked this one question. I said, how old will I be when I die? And it moved around and it moved and it landed and it said, 63. I got two months. I think about that. Oh, you think I'm laughing? Honey, I, I've thought about that, right, babe? No, I'm not kidding. I cannot wait for New Year's Day. Made it. And do not text me on New Year's Day. Hey, good to see you, Steve. Glad you're here. Some of you won't text me. Bummer, man. <laughs> so how do the demons view Jesus? Well, look at this text. This is a fell 
before him. Look at the text. They fell before him. Now think about this. There's fallen angels. They've been judged. 2 Peter 2, 4 says that God did not spare the angels when they sinned. In other words, when they sinned, God did not extend them grace. When we sin, God extended us grace because we're made in his image and they are not. But why did they bow before him? Look at verse 11. What did they do and why did they bow? It's simple. It's right there in the Bible. It's because they said, we know you are the son of God. We know you are the king. And in James 2, it says, you believe God is one. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. And let me give you a reminder and a warning to those who do pass away. I didn't write this, just so you know. Who do pass away without Jesus. That in Philippians 2, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and there will be individuals that will stand before him without knowing him and they will do just as the demons did. Why? Because they know who he is. You are the son of God. And then what does Jesus do in verse 12? He gives them strict orders to not say that. Do not say that I am the son of God. Now you would think that that might help you out in your evangelism. You might think, well, wait a minute. If a demon actually proclaims him to be the son of God and it's weird and it's strange and it's otherness, you would say, well, why doesn't he do that? Because he does not want a liar to be the proclaimer. He doesn't need him. (laughs) But I'll tell you this, demons do not see Jesus as a lunatic, and they do not see him as a liar, just so you know. They see him as the son of God. They have a belief system. You need to know that. But then we have the apostles, and we see that the apostles have some things that they want to help us understand as it relates uh, relates to Jesus being the son of God to you and I in this room. When I was studying this section, I was like, oh, this is so good. Oh, I'm liking this part. Let me read it to you. Verses 13 through 15. Jesus went up onto the mountainside and he called him those he wanted. And they came to him and he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Now, I just want to mention to you in terms of the apostles prior to this, within the chapters prior to this chapter three, is that Peter and Andrew and James and John had already stepped forward and followed Jesus. But I want you to see the transition between the crowd and the apostles. And that is this, is that the crowd, they came for what they could get. But it's here you'll see that Jesus moves away from the crowd to those who want to hear what he has to say. That's when you get to the apostles. It's like their ears peek up and they go, oh, I think I'm ready to hear more about the message than all the things that are surrounding me. And so this is where I call this section the call to be a disciple. The call to be a disciple. Now, I want you to know that in those days, rabbis would actually have students come be with them. It wasn't anything new. The word apostle is nothing new. They knew that, that every rabbi would have an apostle because they would be the ones that would represent them and give a message. So don't think it just started with Jesus. It was a word that was common. But it was here that students would apply and try to impress uh, the rabbi so they could be a part of them and hand them in resumes and try to take out others. But you'll notice there's something that happens in this text that is still true today in terms of our own disciple calling. And that is in verse 13. He called to him those he wanted. Notice Jesus called them out. And he does it today in John 15. You have not chosen me, but I chose you. He calls them out. Just like he called you out. But here's the second thing that I love in this text as it relates to a call to be a disciple. Is that a disciple always responds. Look at verse 13. They came to him. Guys, there was no resistance. They didn't hold back and and say, ah, I don't really think so. This is a little scary here. They didn't have excuses like, well, wait a minute. First of all, I need to go back and take care of my parents and kind of help out some things, get my life in order before I become a disciple. Not at all. There were no accusations. They weren't thinking, "Uh, you're a little bit weird for me. Ah, peace out. No, this was straight up stuff. They responded. He identified them. He calls them out. It's the same true today. 
Jesus called you. You responded. That's called the call. The disciple learned, look at verse 14. He appointed the 12 that they might be with him. A disciple learns. You see, the disi- a disciple is called. We get that. The calling, this is called a call of salvation. He calls you out of your deadness. You respond because he makes it possible. But you respond to what? To learn. He appointed them that they might be with him. To learn. The disciple is hungry to be fed. Which is why you want me to teach for another hour. Thank you. More is better. I usually hear lessons, whatever, but I just had to say that. felt good. A disciple wants to know so much about Christ. And let me tell you what a disciple learns. When you become a learner, these things are essential to know. And this was what the disciples, the apostles were knowing. That Jesus is the son of God. They would hear Jesus say, I and the Father are one. Now I'm going to learn about the Trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They will hear things from Jesus when he says that all of the scriptures point to me. And you have to ask yourself, really? Why? What is the sacrificial system? What did it mean to be a priesthood, a holy nation? Explain that. But it all pointed to Jesus, he says. That Jesus did not come to save his life, but to lay it down for others. Why didn't Jesus just say, hey, it's all right, forget, let's just move on at the garden? No, you have to understand why he would lay his life down. Can you explain that? Or are we just like the crowd and it doesn't really matter? But a disciple goes, it matters to me. It matters to me. The crowd goes, ah, who needs to know these things? Mm, Just let me come and wait for the donuts following the service. But it matters to the disciple. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father but me. Have you asked yourself why is salvation in Christ and Christ alone? And why all other religions point to the road of destruction? Do you know enough? A disciple wants to know. Then you'll understand the cross. A disciple goes, look at verse 14. Send them out to preach, to have authority, to cast out demons. Don't just learn about the Son of God. Proclaim the Son of God. Our pastor, Greg Cahalan, of whom many of you, as you listen to him teach, are like myself, loving what he brings to our church. He's going to help us understand what it is to be a missional Community, a church that disciples, learns, and goes, along with Christy Knott, who's coaching and helping our groups know that it's more than learning. It's to go, and to go is scary. To go can be a little challenging, don't you think? To go is hard and uncomfortable. How would you like to be Jesus' disciples in 15 when he says, hey, guess what your going is going to be? What? Oh, you're going to go cast out demons. All right. See the difference? It's still challenging, isn't it? And a disciple's ordinary. I love this section. A disciple is ordinary. Disciple is called, they respond, they learn, they're a goer, but they're ordinary. A disciple has no resume. They really have no skill. There's not a scale. It's not like Jesus walked up and go, okay, you're kind of pretty, You're sort of pretty. You are not going to be my disciple. You are not pretty. Those things didn't happen. Or he wasn't calling for a skill set. Or ask questions like, hey, what's your grade point average? Good thing, right? Or your success story in business. But I'm going to ask you the question, who are these 12 that Jesus calls out? They're ordinary. You guys... They are no names. And some of the men on this list, that's before you in this text, you've never even heard of, probably. You might be able to mention some of the apostles, but there's a good chance you don't know about all of the apostles. Well, you're in good company. And there must be a reason for that. You would have thought that Jesus would have had 12 extra ordinary disciples doing extraordinary things with extraordinary books. 
It's not what he does. These men are not the cream of the crop and they're not the highest, the noblest, and the most educated. And what do these ordinary men do? I'll tell you what these ordinary men do. And actually, Jesus doesn't care if you and I know about everything about them. Did you know that? We are so into idolizing humanity. He doesn't even let us do that with his own disciples. He wants you to keep them ordinary as well. But look what he does. He builds his church around these guys. Because these ordinary men change the world. And he doesn't care if you and I know all of their story. He changed the world with them. The church is built on their foundation, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the major and the minor prophets. He puts them in their league. What? Oh, it doesn't even end there. He tells us that on the new earth, there's going to be this amazing wall that's going to be coming. And on that wall, there's going to be some names. And today, we don't know much about these names, but I'll read it to you because it's 7 Revelations 21. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on each, uh, on the east and three on the north. And there on the south, there were on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Now listen to this. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of Israel. Jesus. So when we spend eternity, we're going to see their name memorialized. And they will all have significance in a day. But today, they're ordinary. So what happened to these ordinary men? They changed the world. Peter was crucified upside down. We know that It was Mark who took the dictation from Peter in the book that we're studying. And James was the first to be executed. And John died on his island, but he wrote the book of Revelation and the Gospel of John and some others. And Andrew, we know very little about him, but we do know that there are some historians that tell us he died and he was crucified. And instead of being nailed, they prolonged his suffering. They let him hang to death. And then there's Philip. We know a little bit about him. He was stoned to death. And then there's Nathaniel. He was bound and thrown into the sea. And Matthew, he was burned at the stake, but he wrote the gospel. But still, we know not a whole lot about him. And Thomas, we know he denied, but he went to India and he was speared to death. And James, the son of Alphaeus, stoned to death by Jesus. We know nothing about him. And then there's Thaddeus. We know nothing about him. He's in Turkey and he's stoned to death. And Simon the Zealot, he was a terrorist. We know nothing about him. And he goes to Egypt in his sodden too. These men are ordinary and they change the world. And do you think they're like us? Yes. Feeling inadequate. Feeling like I don't know how to speak or lead or to share. Absolutely. When we believe that, then you are right where Jesus wants you. But I want us to look at the kingdom doubter. Kingdom doubter. Look at this text because we saw what the belief was with the crowd. We know that demons believe in the Son of God, but we know that to be a disciple is to be like the apostles. And they believe he's Lord. Crowd could give a rip. Demons know he's the son of God, but they'll never bow. And then you've got the apostles who say, you are the son of God. But now we have kingdom doubters. And I want you to see here. And it's kind of interesting that the text shows who these guys are, right? You would go, now I get it if we're going to talk about kingdom doubters to be other kind of people. But I want you to see who Mark says are the kingdom doubters. He says, then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said guys he's out of his mind let me share this mark is the only gospel that reveals the dysfunction of jesus's family luke doesn't do it mark does and how do we know that because it is the family that is coming with the charge against jesus and they're calling him a lunatic as a family. We've got some serious dysfunction going on here. See, the family's dysfunction is shown in verse 21 when it says they came to take charge of him. That, you know what that charge is? If you think you are dealing with a lunatic, what are you doing? You tie him up. You bind him. You drag him away. Why? Because you don't want him to hurt themselves, right? 
That's what this dysfunctional family's doing. Now, I have to wonder a little bit because I think about Mary. She's coming too. And she knew that she was told he was the son of God. And Mary also knew that she gave birth and she was a virgin. See, I don't think she doubted the message. I think she's a typical mom. Who worries? And it really doesn't matter the age. My mom still worries about me today. Actually, I love it. It's the job of a mom. What you doing today? Worrying. Oh, okay. Which kid you worrying about? Oh, you, you know, that one. Oh, that's good. Don't tell me about it. But what do I think she comes for? She doesn't think he's a lunatic. I think she comes because she doubts his wisdom with the crowd. Remember, he's got people just crushing in on him and they want to just touch me and almost kill him. And so she doubts his wisdom. And she's thinking, if I take him home, maybe I can help him be a little bit of a better Messiah. I'll give him some insights on how he can do his job a little bit better. But you have the family's dysfunction, right? What do they say? These are the siblings. They say in verse 21, he is out of his mind. He's a lunatic. Now, I think what's happening is when they're calling Jesus a lunatic in this family of dysfunction is they're kind of thinking, well, I saw the signs. Did you see the signs? I saw the signs. What about you, Jude? Did you see the signs? What about you, James? I saw the signs. And what were those signs? He was odd. He was very odd growing up. Well, that's because he was without sin and sin next to perfect is exposed and you don't like it. And so can you imagine Jesus with perfect comments and perfect responses and perfect reactions? How would you enjoy that? What it does is it binds those together in jealousy. And so what do they do? They say, you know, Jesus, this claiming to be the son of God, you're out of your mind, so we're going to come and save you from yourself. I want to do a little bit of fast forward because this is the beauty of the Bible and I love scripture for helping us with this. And that is, you're going to see that this is a family moving from dysfunction the beauty of the Bible is it helps us know the rest of the story. We're going to see them move from dysfunction to function. They move from lunatic to Lord. We know that in Acts 1, 14, Jesus ascends to be to the right hand of the Father. The church gathers around in prayer, waiting for the ascending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And it's there, it says, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers are in prayer. We're talking family conversion. My brother is not a lunatic. He's my Lord. And we know that because the letter of James, who's Jesus' half-brother, says, I'm a slave to Jesus. And Jude, I'm a slave. They don't even claim to be brother. Because the brother doesn't get you into heaven. It's the work and the life and the death of Jesus that is that which saves us. And so we see this family now believes in the Son of God. This family believes in the resurrection. They went from calling him a lunatic to knowing that he's alive and that he's conquered death and he's conquered sin. And his family believes that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. But then we get to another section. You ever been around people that you say to yourself, I don't believe this individual will ever come to Christ. I want you for one minute to just think of those people in your life. And they just seem like to you, I don't even need to pray for that one anymore because it's just a little challenging. Because I can't imagine. I can't imagine them all of a sudden responding to the call of Jesus. I can't even imagine them opening up the Bible and studying and asking questions about the Son. I can't imagine them, imagine them going and preaching the gospel at your job. <laughs> it's unimaginable, isn't it? Well, my dear friend Mark Eisenzimmer was telling me about how his father was doubting the validity of the Bible and the scriptures. He was truly an antagonistic person because for him, he said to his son, I do not know how you can believe in the Bible. 
How can you believe in the resurrection? How can you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? This cannot even be. And have you had people that point out all the specifics of things that trip them up in the Bible and so therefore it trips me up and that means this book is ultimately crazy and it makes no sense to them. And so you're challenged all the time. And so Mark found his dad, which is hard speaking with your father, right? They still are an authority figure in your life. And he's speaking to him and telling him how silly this stuff is. And then to the family's surprise, Frank, of whom I got to know, gives his life to Jesus after much research. And what does he do? He becomes a disciple of Jesus. The impossible become impossible. But the interesting thing about the story, Mark was sharing with me that his dad, after knowing Jesus three weeks, he's sitting around the table with his family and his, all the siblings are there. And he says, you know what? I do not understand how somebody cannot know Jesus. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> because when you're a disciple and you respond and you know him, you can't wait to go with him. He's not. A liar, is he? He's Lord. Frank said, he's not lying. He's Lord. But we see in this text, though, the spiritual kingdom haters. And I want us to look at the passage. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of the demons, he's driving out demons. And what are these religious people doing? They're saying the message that Jesus is bringing is a fat lie. These are the teachers and the scribes, and they hated his message. They despised it. They secondly hated his actions. Did you know that every time Jesus would do a miracle or feed the 5,000 or heal somebody's physical ailment that they would despise it. And so what did that prove? They hated the person in real life and in real time. They hated him so deeply that they called him, look at the text, they called Jesus a devil. They couldn't stand him. Have you ever hated somebody and you're bothered that others are starting to like him like a crowd? Well, that's what was going on because Jesus was loving the people, and he's restoring the people. He's showing compassion to the people, and they still call him the devil. But I want us to see something very, very, very powerful in this text. Because kingdom haters are not just humanity. It's not just the scribes and the Pharisees. There's something even bigger than that, and Jesus wasn't the one to pose the question. They did. They posed it. Look at this. We're looking at the celestial kingdom. And these are the, the, the kingdom haters who are the demons and Satan and that kingdom. And they make a big mistake to pose the question to the one who knows more about it than anyone on that planet at that time. And Jesus says this. So Jesus called them over to him and he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? Look, you guys are calling me a devil. Well, you tell me this. How in the world can he do this? So what does Jesus do in this text? He begins to teach them a little bit about the world that he judged. You think you know about it? I'm going to teach you first. Look at verse 24. If a kingdom is divided against itself, you need to know this. It can't stand. In other words, Jesus is telling them, Satan, I know about his kingdom. And truly, trust me, it's not divided. It's focused and it's focused this way. Satan's kingdom despises Jesus's kingdom. He hates all of his kingdom and he knows it's a kingdom that is real and he hates the angels that are a part of it even though one day he was friends with them before he was judged. And kingdom, Satan's kingdom despises humanity. He's very focused on that. Satan hates you. He's not off mission. And Satan's kingdom is so perverted and so evil, it is entertained by murder and sex and sin and stealing. He's on mission. He hasn't changed his mind about that. And Satan's kingdom is strong and people doing very well. And so why does Jesus say, it can't be divided? It's on focus. Because with me, you need to know about my kingdom. My kingdom is a kingdom of purity and holiness. 
He doesn't like that. My kingdom loves humanity. Why? Because I made them in my image. And my kingdom isn't perverted. I'm not entertained by their sexual sin. I'm not. He is. And Satan's house is... Look at his house in verse 25. If a house is divided against itself, it can't stand. What does he mean? Is that his house is not divided. It's in a location, and it's real. I remember one time my son Daniel and Drew Peterson, when they were about five, and a guy came up to them. And when he came up, he, he actually asked them if he would be, they would be willing to get into his van. He was going to kidnap my son. But fortunate to us, a lady came in and actually prevented it. And I think to myself, imagine if that guy would have had his way. If he would have taken that evil vision that he had to place it on my son and for me to be standing today with my wife and we'd not know where she is or where he is. You talk about the fear of a parent. There's a thing called Stockholm Syndrome and it's this. Where people kidnapped are convinced that the abuser has the best interest in mind. So when I talk about Satan's house and he kidnaps people, Jesus says he kidnaps them and his house is kidnapping people and it's not divided. And I want to tell you who's kidnapped. The teachers and the scribes, they are convinced by the kidnapper that they are doing God's will. And Jesus says, you're doing the will of the devil. What about the kingdom doubters? They they can't trust the message because Jesus is a lunatic. And for the crowd, I could give a rip. I just want to come and feel good, but I don't need to learn about who the Son of God is. But I will tell you, we have all lived in Satan's house. We've all been kidnapped. And we all need to have somebody rescue us, to come into that house and to get us out of that house because Satan's house is not divided. And if Satan opposes, in verse 26, himself and is divided, he can't stand. Satan hates the Son of God. Throughout the Old Testament, he tried to destroy the line of David. It is here that at Jesus' birth, what did he do? He hates hated him by bringing Herod to destroy him, even to the point of the cross. And then he goes, oh my gosh, the resurrection happened. He's alive. Jesus, Satan can't stand up again. Jesus isn't dualism, good and evil. This is the creator who created him. Little. So when he plunders this, bam, it's good stuff. It's God against that which he created. And so Jesus says in verse 27, In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Jesus is not divided. You need to know that Jesus' kingdom is coming to bind the strong man. It's the fulfillment of Genesis 3 when he says at the cross, here's the promise of the Messiah. Oh, at the cross, Satan, let me tell you, you will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. It's like a boxer, pop you in the jaw. He knocks you a little bit off balance. Your knees give out. And here's what happened at the cross. Oh, prior to the cross, you were very focused. Oh, prior to the cross, the nations were in bondage. But after the cross, you got popped. And after you got popped, now you're a leader that is confused. And it's not as good as you once were. And now the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. He is doing this. Jesus' kingdom through his life and death and resurrection has plundered the house because of the resurrection. And Jesus' kingdom has come to save the kidnapped, to rescue the kidnapped. In Christ alone, through faith alone, and by grace alone. He pays the ransom, but he doesn't pay the devil a nickel. He pays for us. Let me end with a couple thoughts. Verse 28. We're saved by grace. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins. And every blasphemy, as slander is used, they utter. In other words... Kingdom haters, the ones that are impossible, the apostle Paul was one of them. He was a scribe. He was a kingdom hater. He was a blasphemer. He believed that 
Jesus was not the son of God and was actually the devil. He says it in 1 Timothy 1.13. He calls himself a blasphemer. But then this kingdom hater is saved by grace. And Jesus is no longer a liar in the apostle Paul. He's Lord. And so in verse 29 and 30, it startles them, the kingdom haters. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Now remember, the apostle Paul believed that. So to slander the Holy Spirit is not a one-time sin. You just need to know that. It is being a Jesus hater to the degree that I'm going to harden my heart and keep it that way. To slander the Holy Spirit's work in Christ's life through the healings and the feeding of the 5,000 is demonic isn't forgivable. To hold on to this theology can't save you. It's heresy. To slander the Holy Spirit's work as the devil is the one sin that Jesus doesn't like. Let me end with this word from C.S. Lewis. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a man-man is something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit on him, and you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. And let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus, we thank you for your Bible, for your word. Pray for the groups this weekend. And Father, we just would pray that... You would continue to work in our lives as being your disciples, that we'd want to know you and then go to the ends of the earth because there's victory in your son. In Jesus' name, amen.